let me tell you about a friend of mine. His name was Walter Bard. He's dead. Walt was like me, a Seamus, a gumshoe, a private dick. Except I'm not in the blackmail game, and that's probably why I can still pour a drink down my neck. You see, Walt was shaking down this dame for 20 G's until he got a delivery of hot lead. The daughter of some political scumbag in a monkey suit got involved, and some not very nice ink slingers tried to make it into a scandal. Murder, corpse stealing, jailbreaks, poisoning. If I didn't know old Walt firsthand, I would have thought this was the plot of a dime novel. In 1946, some Hollywood types decided that it would make a good picture. It ain't quite accurate, but it tells the story better than I can. They called it Behind Green Lights. pretty well on the police run, Johnny, so I don't think you'll have much difficulty contacting the various departments. These cops are good guys, but they got belly aches like you and me, so name them and give them a break whenever you can. They pay cops off with peanuts the way they do newspaper men. No! I want you to get it off without breaking it. Your wife can't steal your car. That's community property. Yeah, I, I know, Chief, but she done took it out of the community. Come on, Johnny, I want you to meet the lieutenant. He's a good egg. What do you like to do? Dance? Harry James? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Or why don't you turn on the radio in one of your homes? Fix yourself some donuts and coffee and stuff. Hanging out in a joint like the one Carrie pulled you out of, it'll buy you nothing but trouble. Carrie, see if these two girls get home, will you? Yes, sir. Hiya, Sam. Hello, Oppenheimer. Hi. Meet Johnny Williams, the Herald's gift to the police department. This is Lieutenant Carson, Sergeant Oppenheimer. Hi, Hi, young fella. It's sure nice to meet you guys. You love him when you get to know him better. Johnny's fixing to clean up the department. I thought you ought to look him over. Oh, cut it out, eh? The Herald's a good paper, Johnny. That's the best paper in town, Lieutenant. The Herald has ideals. Only the truth is fit to print. I wish I could say as much for that rag of yours, Ames. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's your first day on the police run, Johnny? Yeah. Gosh, I hope I don't pull any boners. You won't. Drop around and see me any time you feel like it. Maybe I'll come up with a scoop one of these days just to keep Ames and the rest of those pelicans in line. Yeah, that'd be great, Lieutenant. Yeah, I sure need one. <laughs> come on, Johnny, meet the rest of the Okay, game. I'll see you later. All right. Bye. That's a tough assignment for that nice kid. Oh, it won't hurt him. Won't do us any harm, either. I'll go down to the Dutchman's for an egg sandwich. I'll go along with you. Come on, will you? Oh, hurry. Boy, 
boys, meet Johnny Williams of the Herald. I have no city news, Sergeant. Don't get up, gentlemen. What is this, a gag? Walter Bard runs a private detective agency in the Ecuador building. Well, they picked a fine spot to dump him. Looks like somebody's trying to give the department the business. Get going, Oppenheimer. Yeah. Precious sakes alive, it's Mr. Bard. Do you know anything about this? Not me, N not me. I just sell him flowers. Take this into the desk. Right. Hey, Sam. What have you got? What do you think? Hey, Sam Carson's first going to step on the sidewalk in front of the station. That's the name of the game, Jim. Don't forget you owe me two bits. Check this gun with ballistics as soon as you can, then have the car gone over for fingerprints. Hey, Sam, who's the... Hey, it's Walter Bar. Dumped right in front of the station. I couldn't get any closer. Boy, there's going to be a stink about this. Yeah, it was mixed up in politics, wasn't it? He was mixed up on everything. He's been asking for something like this for a long time. What's the matter, Johnny? No, I never saw a dead man before. Give me Charlie to make a snack. Hello. Hello. Hold on to your wig, Charlie. Walter Bard, the private eye, was just found shot to death in his car, right at the front door of the joint. Evidently a definite slap at the present administration. You can call it a culmination of the hoodlum war that's been going on. Yeah. Say that it's gangland's despairing reply to the vigilance of the police. Huh? Sure, play it up big, lay it on thick. Everybody's going to be taking pot shots at the administration over this little deal, and the Express is its only friend. Oppenheimer, go up to Obama's apartment, bring back any letters or photographs that might look hot. See if you can get Bart's wife on the phone. Talk to the janitor and neighbors. Get a line on any recent visitors. Okay, Lieutenant. Harper, you chase up to Bart's office in the Equitable Building. Go through his desk and files. Check his appointment calendar. Yes. Well, Lieutenant, I just happened to think. Bard used to hang out at Tony's on 2nd Street quite a lot. Good idea. Say, Wilson, go over there and ask Tony if Bard met anyone there tonight. Then give Oppenheimer a hand if he needs to. Right. Yes? Mrs. Bard doesn't answer, Lieutenant. She's probably sleeping. Keep on trying. Okay. Hey, Dan. Johnny, this is Daniel Boone Wintergreen. He covers police for the sun. Also has the policy corner on the side. Meet Johnny Williams of the Herald. Right. Pleasure to meet you, my boy. I can see that you'll be a welcome contrast to the riffraff that infests this mortuary. When are you going to get rid of that moth-eaten trophy you got on? Sir, this buffalo coat belonged to my grandfather, Daniel Boone Wintergreen. Noted Indian fighter. Nothing would persuade me to part with it, except a temporary shortage of funds. Are you in need of a good overcoat, Mr. Williams? Hey, lay off him, Wintergreen. On a hot day, that coat gets higher than the stockyards in the south wind. Come in, Doc. Well, here it is, Sam. The bullet went clean through him, smashed the fifth rib. Have you boys found it yet? In the front seat of Hole Street. Discharged from the gun that was in the car? Mm-hmm. His own. There were plenty of powder burns, Sam. Could have been suicide. Not a chance, Doc. The boys at the desk would have heard the shot. Body was driven there in Bart's car and left there. Oh, I'm sure you're right, Sam. Do you think someone's trying to discredit us in the administration? Could be. Holy mackerel. That girl couldn't be mixed up in this case. Well, this is very interesting. The daughter of Luther Bradley, the reform candidate for mayor. Boy, what the Express will do with this. Send Brewer in. Must be some other Bradley. Somehow I don't think it is. Why? The famous Calvert Luck, my boy. Brewer, you and Robbins go out to the Luther Bradley house on Carlisle. Ask for Miss Janet Bradley. Tell her you'd appreciate it if she'd come back with you. We want to ask her a few questions. Okay. Handle her carefully. All we want is her cooperation. Stress that, Brewer. Yes? Mrs. Barr still doesn't answer. Keep trying. Express? I want to speak to Mr. Calvert. Very important. It's Dr. Yeager talking. 
Hello. Yeah, this is Calvert. Oh, hello, Doc. What's on your mind? Walter Bard. Sure, I know him. Well, who shot him? I don't know, but his body was found in his own car right in front of the police station here. That's right, the police station. And get this, Mr. Calvert. There was a notation in Bard's memorandum book that he had an appointment with Janet Bradley this evening. Luther Bradley's daughter? Are you sure? Oh, 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 this is beautiful. Look, Doc, you stay there and keep your eyes open. I'll keep in touch with you. Oh, I'll be right here, Mr. Calvert. You can count on me. Goodbye. This is Miss Bradley, Lieutenant. Lieutenant Carson. How do you do? Sorry we had to bring you out this hour of the night, Miss Bradley. Sit down, please. What do you know about a man named Walter Bard? You knew him? Knew him? He was murdered this evening. Oh. In his own car, shot. I found him about 11.45 in front of this police station. You did know him? Yes, I, I knew him. Seen him recently? This evening. I had an appointment with him at his apartment. Were you a friend of his, Miss Bradley? No. Suppose you tell me why you went to see him. I'm sorry, I can't. Private? That's not so good. Is your father still in Washington? Yes, he'll be back on Monday in time for the election. This murder could prove very embarrassing for your father, Miss Bradley. A dead body on your doorstep could prove very embarrassing for the department, too, Lieutenant Carson. Maybe. Do you mind very much if we take your fingerprints? Is that necessary? Well, it's a routine we follow, but of course, if you'd rather not. Oh, very well. Thank you. This way, please. Now the right hand. You can wipe off your hands with this. Oh, thank you. My uh, photograph next, Lieutenant. Sitting's by appointment only. That's all there is to it. That'll be classified up, honey. It will take a few minutes to make comparisons. You don't mind waiting. Of course not. Right in there. You're being swell about this. Yes? Max Calvert to see you, Lieutenant. Send him in. Thanks, Sam. I just thought I'd drop in and say hello. I figured you'd be around. Well, I don't wonder you're sore, Sam. Someone giving the police department the business, huh? The administration, too. The administration's your problem. Ah, oh, now that's not the attitude to take, Sam. Don't forget, we got an election coming up next Tuesday. I'm a policeman, not a politician. I know, but a politician sometimes could do an awful lot for a policeman, Sam. I understand you got the Bradley girl down here. So you know all about that, huh? Well, people usually cooperate with me, Sam. She was with Bard this evening, wasn't she? I'm not making any statements, and when I do, the Express will get it, along with the other papers. Well, you're not letting a pretty face affect your better judgment, are you, Sam? I'm not letting that tabloid of yours spare that girl's reputation so you can stop Luther Bradley on Tuesday. Well, the public has the right to know the facts. Express Princeton. Yeah. Anything for a nickel. <laughs> Look, Sam. How long have you had this job? Long enough. When you first came into this department, I was still on the police run for the Express. Now, I own it. While we're looking around, look at Mike Shea there. Now, Mike was your type of copier. He never played ball. So what did it get him? A load of lead in the belly. Ah, you ought to be smart, Sam. Look, is Bradley anything to you? No. Well, Jordan's on his way out. How'd you like to be chief? I'd like it. You know that, Calvert. Could be arranged. How? Well, if this Bradley girl were booked, 
It might please some very important people very much. And they might be willing to do a lot for you. There isn't a particle of evidence against her. Well, no one would criticize you if you'd book her anyway. Not suspicion or a material witness, anything you like. Until after the election. Then let her go. She'd be all right. Do that and you'd have a grand jury investigation right in your lap. Oh, Sam, now don't look at it that way. Why, a week after the election, the whole thing will be completely forgotten. Think it over. Don't forget, Sam, it always pays to cooperate. Always pays. So those opportunistic leeches at the papers get a whiff of something and they're on it like a bloodhound on a stiff. This ain't quite the way it really went down, but hey, Hollywood knows how to spin a good yarn. This Jana Bradley dame seems to have gotten her hands dirty, literally, and won't give up the goods. You got the editor of some sleaze rag trying to hot put the cops into booking her so her old man loses the election, but Sammy boy ain't playing ball. He's got his eyes on the skirt and won't smear her name even though it's going to cost him the chief's chair. I can't complain about the cast they picked. William Gargan plays a great straight version of the head copper. Between acting jobs early in his career, Gargan was hustling bootleg whiskey. Carol Landis' Janet ain't a bad pick. I'd walk a mile for her as soon as I would for a camel. Of course, Ms. Landis is best known for her work on the 1940 classic One Million B.C. Around Hollywood, Landis was known as The Chest, which makes me think she was known for more than just her bleach blonde hair and her piercing blue eyes. We'll get more dope on the case after this short break. People everywhere are flashing the smart new Old Gold Filter Pack. The new OG pack. Why? Well, sure, because it's a track filter pack. But that's the just new... the invitation. It's what's inside that's really important. Taste. The best taste yet in a filter cigarette. We guarantee you it comes out here. Flavor fresh. The best taste yet in a filter cigarette. Because OG filters are... Flavor fresh. That's right. You see... All Gold's rich, nature-ripened tobaccos are put through an exclusive flavor-fresh process to give you the height of flavor and freshness. Flavor Fresh! Flavor Fresh Old Gold Filters. The best taste yet in a filter cigarette. Pick up this smart new pack today. Flavor Fresh! What's the best way to reduce? Eat what you want or starve yourself? Starve yourself? Wrong. A half-empty stomach causes hunger tantrums. Now you can avoid hunger tantrums, lose weight naturally and fast. With the RDX Full Stomach Reducing Plan, you fill your stomach, yet fat just seems to melt away. And safe, pleasant-tasting RDX tablets contain no dangerous drugs, no hormones. So if you want to eat and lose fat, get RDX at your drugstore today. <laughs> an appointment at 4th and Main when, you know, it started to rain. Made the awning at a bakery shop, took one look, said, rain, don't stop. Even all wet, this girl looked great. I said, a cigarette while we wait? Viceroy? That's right. I said, Viceroy tastes the way you'd like a filter cigarette to taste. Not too strong, not too light. Viceroy's got the taste that's right. That's right. That's right. The sun came out, the sky turned blue. Maybe Viceroy can do the same for you. That's right! Now you know and you can take all bets. If you smoke all seven filter cigarettes, you'll find some too strong, some too light. But Viceroy's got the deep weave filter. And the taste that's right. Not too strong, not too light. Viceroy's got the taste that's right.
Great guy, wasn't he, Lieutenant? He sure was. I guess he was just about the greatest cop this city ever had. Yeah, wanted to get him. Lieutenant, I got something to show you. See you, William. What'd you find in Bard's apartment? Cigarette butts in the ashtray with two different shades of lipstick. Two glasses with prints on both. Prints on the gun, on one of the glasses, and Miss Bradley's fingerprints, all check. Looks like an open and shut case, Lieutenant. Bring Miss Bradley in, Sergeant. The Lieutenant would like to see you, Miss Bradley. All right, Oppenheimer. Miss Bradley, we found your fingerprints on a highball glass in Bard's apartment. Oh, yes, he, he poured a drink for me, but I set it down without tasting it. We also found your fingerprints on the gun with which Bard was shot. All right. I'll tell you exactly what did happen. I went to see Bard on behalf of someone who was very close to me. Someone whom he was trying to blackmail. He made a business of buying and selling information about people. Especially about those who had built honest lives after making a bad start. Prominent people. He had come to me with certain information. He wanted $20,000 for it, but I'd been able to raise only 10. Well, come in, Miss Bradley. Won't you sit down? I'll fix you a drink. Oh, oh I really don't care for one, thank you. Very nice burger here. Cigarette? Oh, thank you. Well? I simply haven't been able to raise that much money, Mr. Bard. How much have you raised? Ten thousand. And I said twenty. Well, that settles that. Oh, please, won't you give me a little more time? Look, I... Miss Bradley, you're stalling. You either haven't got the money or you won't go to the one who has got it. Now, I'm holding a powerhouse. Newspaper clippings, letters, affidavits, photographs. Enough dynamite to blow the lid a mile high. And I've got a cash customer who'll pay twenty thousand in the morning. Suppose it'd be useless to appeal to your sense of decency. Oh, completely. You see, I haven't any. Not since I put on long pants. And I've been called all the names, Miss Bradley. I can believe that. But I do know when a girl needs a drink. Take it. You look shaky. Now, give me that envelope. You'll find them all there. Don't believe it. I'd rather enjoy putting an end to your activities. Stay where you are. He was very much alive when I left him, Lieutenant. Miss Bradley, do you expect me to believe that chisel lets you take those papers away from him? But I, I've told you the exact truth. What happened to the gun? I threw it in his car when I left. What'd you do with the envelope? Burned it as soon as I got home. What was in it? I, I can't possibly tell you. It must have been hot if Bard wanted that kind of dough for it. Holding back now won't do you a bit of good. What was it about, your father? It's no use asking me. What was in it? Dirt Bard had dug up? Something Calvert could use? Let me help you. You couldn't make a deal with him. He said he'd take you home. It was raining. You go down to his car. He makes a pass at you. You grab his gun, let him have it, and scram with the envelope. The brakes in the car come loose and the car starts rolling. Lieutenant, you... You sound as if you want to believe I killed Walter Bard. Your prints are on the gun. You have motive, plenty of it. What do you expect me to believe? I guess it does look pretty bad. What are you going to do with me? 
I ought to book you. You know what that will do to my father on Tuesday. I realize the pressure you're under, Lieutenant. I've learned a great deal about the police department from father. Max Calvert could do a lot to help you if you could learn to do things his way. Leave Calvert out of this. I'm a policeman, not a politician. I'm glad. I've always liked policemen. I should book you. Otherwise, I can't hold you. If you don't mind waiting a little longer, well, something may turn up. You mean you may see things a little more clearly? Put it anywhere you like. In here, please. You guys mind if I want a hand? No. Nope. Okay. Oh, well, this character always wins. Hello, Doc. Anything new on the bar killing? Well, he was shot with his own gun that was found in the car. Mm -hmm. Well, we know all about that. Yeah, but what you don't know is that Janet Bradley, Luther's daughter, is mixed up in the case. No. no kidding. That's right. Carson has her downstairs now. She had a date with Bard in his apartment this evening. Regular little mine of information, aren't you, Doc? Well, I, I just thought the boys should know. That's nice of you. But I'm still running the night shift around here, and I'll give out the information. The Express already has it. I don't need to tell you how they got it. So you boys might as well have it, too. Miss Bradley is involved. To what extent, we don't know yet. She was in Bard's apartment this evening, but she gives a perfectly logical reason for being there. Well, that's good enough for the front page. I'd go slow on any insinuations if I were you fellas. Did you get well, that, Charlie? Right. That was Costner, sir. Hello, give me Mr. Yeah. Jones. Here's the latest dope on the Bard case. Miss Janet Bradley, junior league, active in everything. Oh, yes, Mr. Jones, I'm sticking right on the job. I just wormed it out of the lieutenant this minute. Janet Bradley, daughter of the Merrill candidate, is being questioned with regard to the Bard murder. Yes. And you'll leave those two tickets for the Philharmonic. You right boys there. won't forget who gave you the original tip. We won't forget. Dr. G.F. Yeager. Oh, don't worry about that, Dr. Dickinson. Now, which one of you has taken my scissors? I stuck them in your buffalo coat for safekeeping. If you moochers insist on playing childish pranks with my scissors, I'll be forced to do something drastic. Well, it's about time. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Calvert. I didn't know you were here. I hope you haven't been waiting long. Long enough. Where have you been? Oh, all over. It, it's been a very busy night. Has Carson booked the Bradley girl yet? Not yet. He's stalling, Mr. Calvert. I don't trust Carson. He's never played along with us the way he should. Why, he just bawled me out for tipping off the press room that he'd been questioning the girl. I want her charged with murder, and I want it spread all over the front page of every paper in town. Sooner the better. Oh, thank you. I'll save this for later. I'm going to give this murder the biggest coverage any local paper's had in years. I'll run the Bradley girl's picture every day. Diagrams of the street where the body was found. Diagrams of Bard's apartment. Pictures of the murder car. I'll have a sob sister covering her appearance at the inquest. Every appearance in court. I'll do a half column devoted to her costume alone. How she looks. With the inference that she's frightened, that she's hiding something, that her back's against the wall. Yes, but the only hitch, Mr. Calvert, is that Walter Bard didn't die of a gunshot wound. What did you say? He was poisoned before he was shot. Who did it? I don't know. You cut him open? I didn't have to. I found traces of poison in his mouth. Well, have you told Carson? Not yet. Well, don't. The trouble is, if Carson ever takes a good look at the body, he'll notice that there was practically no bleeding. And he'll know what that means. Then we've got to get rid of the body. Get it out of here, fast, tonight. Before the inquest, I can't. You can, and you're going to. But, Mr. Calvert, you can't just pick up a body and drag it out of the morgue before the chief medical examiner has had a whack at it. Look, have you got any John Doe's in the icebox? One that you can ship out to the crematorium in a hurry? Well, there, there's a floater that we fished out of the bay a couple of weeks ago. All right, now, you go down to the morgue and switch Walter Bard's body to the John Doe slab. Then make out commitment papers for John Doe. Cremation and ship it out tonight. But it's sure to be found out sooner or later. If you have to, make the morgue attendant the fall guy. V. Squawks, you send him to me, you understand? Well, I'll, I'll do my best, Mr. Calvert. Your best is to get that body out of here fast. Yes? Mrs. Barr on the wire now, Lieutenant.
Hello? Is this Mrs. Walter Bard? Yes, this is Mrs. Bard. You've been ringing for some time, haven't you? I'm sorry. I was sound asleep. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. But that isn't possible. He wasn't at... I'm afraid he was, Mrs. Bard. Uh, we don't know yet. I'll have to ask you to come down here. I know it'll be difficult, but you may be able to help us. Of course, but... But I haven't seen Walter for several weeks. We haven't been living together. Yes. As soon as I've dressed. Yes? Arthur, something dreadful has happened. It's Walter. Did the police say how it happened, Nora? Or where? No, Arthur. No. They've asked me to come down to the station. No. Remember, you haven't been out all evening. I'll go with you. Well, certainly, I'm your lawyer. Don't worry, darling. Everything will be all right. Yes. Pick me up on your way down to the station. In about 20 minutes. It won't take me long to dress. Oh, here's the lab report on the lipstick on the cigarette stubs. Any calls? No, sir. One of them is Janet Bradley's. The other's a shade called Rochelle, used mostly by brunettes. This is Barnes here, Lieutenant. Oh, send her in. Will you come in, please? Sorry you had to come down here tonight, Mrs. Bard. I understand, Lieutenant. This is Mr. Templeton, my attorney. Walter Bard and I would have been divorced. I'm handling all of Mrs. Bard's business affairs. So I asked Mr. Templeton to come with me. Sit down, please. You told Mrs. Bard very little on the telephone, Lieutenant. Well, Bard was shot through the heart. We found his car parked in front of this building, his body in it. But that's fantastic. Well, who did it? Well, we're not prepared to say as yet. Now, Mrs. Bard, I think you told me that you and Bard hadn't lived together for quite some time. Not for over a year. Uh, have you seen him recently? I saw him at a nightclub one evening several weeks ago. I was with Mr. Templeton. We want to be frank with you, Lieutenant. Well, I hope you will be. Nora and I are going to be married. We've been waiting for her divorce from Bard. Had the proceedings begun? No. The papers were ready, but they hadn't been served yet. Did Bard refuse to accept service on these papers? Repeatedly. He was my husband, and even though he's dead... Nora! I'm going to say it, Arthur. He was mean and cruel. He liked to hurt people. He did it deliberately. I studied for two years. Mrs. Bard has had a very difficult time, Lieutenant. Yes, I know. Mrs. Bard, uh, you were home all evening? Yes. I was asleep when you telephoned. You weren't in Bard's apartment at any time during the course of the evening. Mrs. Bard has already answered that question twice before, Carson. I don't mind answering Lieutenant Carson's question a third time, Arthur. I was not in Walter's apartment this evening, Lieutenant. Were you? No. Thank you. I suppose you know I'll have to ask Mrs. Bard to identify the remains. Naturally. Uh, Oppenheim, will you take care of that? Yeah, sure. This way, please. Listen, pal. I didn't bust that mirror. Somebody else tossed the bottle into the glassware. Name? I'm Zachary, the Philadelphia Phantom. Never heard of you. What's your address? You can't book me, copper. I'm fighting at the Elks tonight. The annual smoker, see? I go on at one o'clock. What's your address? But what about the Elks? You ain't gonna let the Elks down, are you? I'm an odd fellow. The address, Zachary. You can't do it to me, pal. It's my professional reputation. It was at the Benjamin Hotel, Lieutenant. Give the Phantom one of our private suites. He'll see the judge in the morning. But I gotta go on at 1 a.m. I'll come back. Honest, I will. Take him away. So Dr. Yeager, the spineless sap M.E. under the thumb of Calvert, was played by Don Beto. Donnie was planning to go into journalism until he got bit in the brain by the acting bug. He made a name for himself on the Broadway stages starting in 1929 and kept at it for a decade. In pictures, he was usually cast as a fast-talking rat, and when they pinched him to play the sneaky Dr. Yeager in this here story, they were actually making an improvement on the Dr. Yeager I knew. The Walter Bart that I knew wasn't married, or at least he never talked about it. 
but the bigwigs at 20th Century decided that the real Bart wasn't sleazy enough, so they cooked up this gal played by Mary Anderson. Anderson was in Gone with the Wind, and she had a reoccurring role on Peyton Place in 1964. This is Bert Instant Refreshment Peel talking to you from ringside at New York's famous Madison Square Garden. Our guest tonight is the famous hockey star, Philippe Dupre. Bert thought you'd be interested in why Mr. Dupre prefers our refreshing beer. Unfortunately, he speaks no English. Never mind, Harry. I'll handle this. Monsieur Dupre, why do you prefer Peel's beer? Je ne comprends pas. See, Bert, he doesn't... He not... said because Peel's is just what he looks forward to after a long, hard night on the ice. He said but to... Bert, he only said a few Never words. Never mind, Harry. Let's whet a few appetites and show the viewers what Big Philippe means. Here it is, viewers. Instant refreshment from the first taste. Well, that's because our beer is cool brewed. Chilled as it's brewed and aged. And that locks in that clean Peel's flavor. Ah, mais c'est la vieille Peel. Hello, comme c'est rafraîchissant. Comme c'est magnifique. Well, what's he saying now, Bert? I think he's trying to say hello to his mother in Montreal. Friends. It's true, you know. Luckies are made better to taste better. Cleaner, fresher, smoother. And you remember that the next time you buy cigarettes. It's awfully important because, golly, in a cigarette, it's the taste that makes the difference. And Luckies do taste cleaner, fresher, smoother. So come on, be happy. Go, Lucky, make your next carton Lucky Strike. Be happy, go lucky, get better taste. Today. Yes, sir, if you want real entertainment, the best place to find it is in front of a General Electric Black Daylight Big as Life television set. Sports, comedy, drama, news, music. Yes, they're all yours merely at the turn of a dial. This model has a big 16-inch black rectangular tube that lets you see everything that the camera sees true to life, and as big as life. Sparkling contrast and sharp focus give you pictures of such clarity that you feel you're right there on the scene. The cabinet, designed and constructed by America's leading cabinet makers, fits gracefully into any type of room. Genuine mahogany veneers, hand rubbed for lasting beauty and durability, are just one example of the painstaking attention to every detail which makes this cabinet one that you'll be proud to have in your home. The precision engineering and careful assembly techniques used in making this General Electric Black Daylight television set are your assurance of television at its finest. See it in operation at your General Electric dealers tomorrow. And when you see it, well, you'll know that you're seeing the best. I vote for Louis. He has the best beer. What's the best dish in the joint? The blonde, the blonde behind, behind the counter.
Okay, that's all you need. Now get going. One burns, huh? Yep. Give him an easy ride. It's his last one. Stiff's gone. Are you sure you ever had one? Gosh, Bill, I put him in there myself. Let me use your phone. Yeah, Doc. The body must have walked right out of the ambulance. Well, go back over your route. Keep your eyes open and your trap shut. If you can't find the body, report to me as soon as you get here. Well... Somebody else wants Bard's body, huh? Ah, uh, that crew must be double-crossing you. They must know how that body was taken out of the ambulance. Well, I don't believe it. You make them cough up the truth. I want to know who else wants that body. Listen, Jaeger, this is a pretty serious matter. Both for the administration and for the police department, and incidentally for you. But I did everything I could, Mr. Calvert. Everything you asked me to. You find that body and get rid of it. Yes? Sam, a John Doe that was being transported to the Woodbury crematorium has disappeared from the ambulance. What do you mean, disappeared? Well, the boys say that they loaded it into the ambulance, and when they got there, it was gone. Well, what am I supposed to do, pull your rabbits out of my hat? The doors must have fallen open. Tell Riley to send a patrol car over the route the ambulance took. I've already told the crew to retrace their route. Well, find that body before the papers find it for you. Mr. Johnny Williams. Let me speak to Mr. Jones. Quick. I'll call you right back. You're new around here, ain't you? What's your name? Williams, the Herald. And I'm pretty busy. Sure you're busy. You bricklayers is always busy. Unless it's a bouquet you're wanting on the cuff until Saturday night. And then it's Flossie, my darling. Flossie, be a pal. And give us a kiss, Flossie. But I'm on to your banana oil. Look, Flossie. I gotta phone my paper. There's been a murder. Sure, there's been a murder. Didn't he get himself killed with one of me carnations in his buttonhole? And owing me a dollar six bits. Seven of them he died owing me oh, for. Oh, that's a shame, Flossie. But you'll get your money back. And when I ask the cops for me do, what do I get? Bird seed. I'll tell you what you do, Flossie. You go down to the desk. When all I want is me dollar six bits out of the money he died in his pants with. I've been to the desk, and what do I get? Birds, it's sure. But this time you tell a lieutenant that I sent you. Johnny Williams of the Herald. Tell him to give you your dollar six bits, and the Herald will pay it. Tell him I personally guarantee it. Whew. Hello, give me Mr. Jones. Wait. Birdseed. Hello, Mr. Jones. Williams. I got a Lulu on that Walter Bard killing. An exclusive. Yeah. In the press room clothes closet. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I'll call you back, Mr. Jones. Now, oh, where are my scissors? I never seem to be able to find them. Last time, I found them in my overcoat pocket. Here they are, Mr. Wintergreen. Oh. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Wintergreen. I wish people would leave my scissors alone. This time, I'll nail them down. Milk! How many, you guys? Well, that's 
Mr. Rosinski, get a bottle for me, will you? Yeah. Make it one for Wintergreen. Hey, is Wintergreen up there? Yeah, he's here. Tell him I want to buy his buffalo coat. I'll be right up. Hey, no dice. He doesn't want to sell. I never heard of such impertinence. As if I didn't have the right to dispose of my own property. Look, Mr. Wintergreen, you can't sell that overcoat. I hoped you'd bring a chastening influence to this menagerie. Why, it'd be an insult to your grandfather and to the grand old name of Boone. It'd be unpatriotic. I am dreadfully disappointed in you, Williams. Why, that overcoat's made history. It's practically a national monument. You can't have a big lug like Brzezinski delivering milk in it. Why don't you get wise to what you've got? Why, that overcoat ought to be in the Smithsonian Institute. They'd pay real dough for it. The Smithsonian? Uh-huh. Hmm. But do you really think... No, Williams. No, my mind is made up. Oh, 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 oh! Give me Mr. Jones, quick! Sure, Mr. Jones, that's what I said. Walter Bard's body in the press room clothes closet. Hey, there's somebody in there. I know it sounds crazy, Mr. Jones, and I'm not drunk. It's true. There's a guy in here, I tell you. Listen to him holler his head off. Yeah, and I'm the only one that knows it except Wintergreen, and I got him spiked. Absolutely, Mr. Jones. you say? In the press room? Here? What? As soon as I've nailed the guy that sold you that one, I'll be over personally to tell you what kind of a joint I'm running around here. One of those toss pot reporters phoned Haggerty and said that Bard's body is hanging in the press room clothes closet. Say, you don't think he was talking about the John Doe that Jaeger lost? There's only one way to find out. That's what I said, you dope, all wrapped up in somebody's overcoat in the press room closet. My overcoat, please. Credit where credit is due. Hey, look, you guys, a perfect fit. <laughs> hey, what goes on? I found Bard, all wrapped up in Wintergreen's overcoat in the clothes closet. Now, Harold's printing it, so relax, fellas, and save paper. Don't yes, you think this is best for you, Give me rewrite, sweetheart. Hurry it up. Agony was right, it is Bard. Say, this guy didn't bleed much. Did you say anything about that? Not to me. Have him taken back, Sergeant. Have the arnold, Lieutenant. Mr. Jones again. Okay, you'll, you'll get it. Let's get your shirt Jones. on. Jones, all right. Lieutenant Let's Carson, see. examine the body now. Yeah. 30 years, Lieutenant. I've been putting him on ice. Nobody ever done this to me before. Where was he? In here. Pull it out. That's the John Doe we fished out of the bay. The one Doc Yeager committed tonight for cremation. How'd it get in there? I don't know, Lieutenant. I put him in number seven myself. There's been a switch. Here's Doc Yeager now. What's this all about, Sam? It looks as if someone went outside as that John Doe you lost. Only it wasn't John Doe, it was Walter Bard. John Doe is here in Bard's place. Boy, this is absurd, Sam. A lot of things are tonight. You signed a commitment paper, didn't you? Yes, for John Doe. Well, Bard's body must have been picked up by mistake. That's the only way it could have happened. Well, so long as it turned out all right. Well, Mally, get that John Doe out of here. Put Bart back in the right place. And see that he stays there until the chief medical examiner's through with him. Yes, sir. Is this Mrs. Bard? Hello, Mrs. Bard. This is Ames of the Express. The Express? Oh, uh, I haven't the slightest idea what connection Miss Bradley has with the case. In fact, I didn't know she was even acquainted with my husband. You're welcome. What was it, Norman? A report on Express. The police have found out Janet Bradley was in Walter's apartment tonight. Arthur, we've got to go to the police station and tell them the truth. No, we've got to sit tight. If we do, we'd never trust each other again, Arthur. There'd always be that doubt. It'd grow and keep on growing. In the end, it'd break us apart. 
We'd distrust each other for the rest of our lives. At this moment, Arthur, there's a voice inside me saying, I'm not sure of him. Do you really mean that, Nora? Yes, I do. And maybe there's a voice inside you saying, I'm not sure of her. Don't you see how right I am, Arthur? We couldn't live together like that. You ought to be the lawyer, Nora. We'll go down to Carson's office right now. Darling. 20th Century Fox pinched Otto Brower to direct this flick. This was Otto's first gig as a director. He had been the second unit director on a handful of nowhere pictures churned out of the back lot. The suits up in the office must not have liked his work too much. They sent him back down the food chain where he took back his role as second unit director. On January 25, 1946, Otto cacked it from a heart attack two weeks before Behind the Green Lights made itself known to the Manhattan socialites. We'll be back after we shill for some sponsors. If you prefer a long cigarette, try Cavaliers, the great new king-size cigarette made by the makers of Camels. King-size Cavaliers give you mildness where it really counts, in the feel of the smoke. So inhale, feel that light extra mildness in the smoke of a Cavalier. Cavaliers are king-size, yet priced no higher than leading regular size brands. So try Cavaliers. Feel that mildness. Taste that flavor. That's a Cavalier. <laughs> Had an appointment at 4th and Main when, you know, it started to rain. Made the awning at a bakery shop, took one look, said, rain don't stop. Even all wet, this girl looked great. I said, a cigarette while we wait? Viceroy? That's right. I said, Viceroy tastes the way you'd like a filter cigarette to taste. Not too strong, not too light. Viceroy's got that taste that's right. That's right. That's right. The sun came out, the sky turned blue. Maybe Viceroy can do the same for you. That's right. Now you know and you can take all bets. If you smoke all seven filter cigarettes, you'll find some too strong, some too light. But Viceroy's got the deep weave filter. And the taste that's right. Not too strong, not too light. Viceroy's got the taste that's right. What's the best way to reduce? Eat what you want or starve yourself? Starve yourself? Wrong. A half-empty stomach causes hunger tantrums. Now you can avoid hunger tantrums, lose weight naturally and fast. With the RDX Full Stomach Reducing Plan, you fill your stomach, yet fat just seems to melt away. And safe, pleasant-tasting RDX tablets contain no dangerous drugs, no hormones. So if you want to eat and lose fat, get RDX at your drugstore today. I'd like somebody to come down here and perform an autopsy. Sure, I know I got Jaeger. I want someone else. Uh, Bard, for a very particular reason. Or how about Doc Hastings? As soon as you can get him down here. I'll see Mrs. Bard now. We've come to make certain alterations in our statement, Lieutenant. What's happened? We told you we weren't at Bard's apartment this evening. Well, we were. Nora was there when Bard died, and I was there later. Go on. I didn't tell Arthur I was going, but I went to ask Walter once more to give me a divorce. There's no use being angry with me, Nora. Take off your things and stay a while. Have a drink? It's a rainy evening. That's finished, Walter. I'm in love with Arthur Templeton. We want to get married. So you can make it legitimate, huh? You have no right to say that. You have absolutely no grounds whatsoever. Perhaps. But I'm not going to turn you loose so Templeton can put you on his income tax. 
Besides, this arrangement suits me fine. So long as I'm married, no woman can make a sucker out of me. But Walter, I... Don't worry. Go into the bedroom. I'll talk with you as soon as I'm through with this party. Well, well. Come in, Miss Bradley. Did you listen? I heard a little. Walter seemed to have some papers that Miss Bradley wanted to buy, but he was holding out for more money. And then? Then there was some sort of scuffle. I don't know what happened. Then Miss Bradley demanded the papers. I got the impression she was covering Walter with a gun. Then a door slammed. Yes? I waited a few minutes, then I went in. Walter had just taken a drink. He took a step toward me. I'll never forget the way he looked. The muscles of his face were all drawn up as if they were knotted. Then he fell into a chair. When I got to him, he was dead. I was terrified. I rushed out of the place. Why didn't you call the police? I was afraid to. Did you take a drink with Bard? No. You remember if Bard's gun was still in the holster? I'm sure it wasn't. But I do remember seeing it there when I first went in. Then who shot Bard? I shot Bard. I went to see Bard for the same reason Nora did. I thought perhaps I could get him to change his mind about the divorce. I just pulled up to the curb opposite his apartment house. Door opened, and Nora came running out. She looked frightened. Before I could get around to calling after her, she had jumped into her car and started off. I noticed that the car in front of the apartment was Bard's. I'd asked her never to go to Bard's apartment again. The more I thought about Nora being there, the less I liked it. The notion that Bard's callousness had driven Nora to killing him took hold of me. That would be murder. It looked like poison to me. All I could think of was that Nora might be traced to the apartment. There was only one thing to do, get the body out of the place. I knew the risk I was running, but I had to do it. dare go back and wait. I'd have to carry him down. He was taking a big chance, but it was late and luck was with me. No one saw me. If I could fake a suicide, Nora's fingerprints wouldn't be on the gun. It would swing suspicion away from her. I held the gun close to him to muffle the shot. It occurred to me then, if Bard's body was found as far as possible from his apartment house, Nora's danger would be still less. I released the brake, and started the car rolling down the hill away from the apartment house. And that's our story. Nora's and mine. Templeton, do you believe Mrs. Bard's story? Yes, I do. Can you believe his? Of course I do. You really came down here to convince each other that you were each telling the truth, didn't you? Partly. We had to speak for Janet Bradley, too, Lieutenant. I'll need a detailed statement from both of you later. Certainly, Lieutenant. You can wait in the outer office. I'm sorry, Flossie, but you'll have to see Lieutenant Carson. See the lieutenant, he says. A dollar six bits. That's if died over. 
knowing me, and he tells me to see the lieutenant. Listen, I will see the lieutenant, and the chief, and the mayor, and the governor if I have to. I'll have me dollar six bits if I have to see the president himself. Sure, Flossie, sure. You're right. I don't blame you a bit. Okay, Malloy. Bird seed. What have you got? No, thanks. We've turned up some new evidence. Does it help me? No. Oh. What is it? Bard didn't die of a gunshot. He was poisoned. Really? Someone slipped the stuff in his whiskey decanter. Oh, wait a minute. You don't think I put the poison in his decanter? Why didn't you drink your highball? Well, I... I didn't want it. How do you think that'll sound in court? Any way you want it to sound, I suppose. Are you going to book me? If you could give me just one solid reason why I shouldn't. I'm sorry for you, Lieutenant Carson. I'm in a bad spot, but so are you. You have to decide whether I'm guilty because I really am guilty or because I'm Luther Bradley's daughter. You book me now, you'll never be sure whether you did it because you really believe I killed Walter Bard or, or because Max Calvert told you to. That's one of the things I'm trying to get straight in my mind. If Calvert wasn't turning on the heat, and another reason, it would have been easy. I'd have booked you, but fast. What other reason? It wouldn't make sense to you or to anyone else. In my kind of job, your reasons have got to make sense. I suppose so. And that means... I'll have to book you the way things stand. Yes, sir. Say, is that nutty woman that sells flowers still in the building? In the building? She's practically in my lap. But don't worry, Lieutenant. I'll get rid of her. Don't get rid of her. I want to see her. Send her in. Then see if you can locate Oppenheimer. Okay, Lieutenant. All right, Flossie. The Lieutenant will see you now. Maybe now I'll get me dollar six bits. Sit down, darling. None of that. All I want is the money that stiff owes me. You mean Bard? He must have died with some assets in his pants, Lieutenant. Don't worry about that. You'll get your dollar six bits. Tell me, did you sell this to Bard? Sure I did. When? Six o'clock this evening, just as he was coming out of Simmy's bail bond office. Didn't he pay you for it? He did not. He never pays you. You've always got to chase him. Up to the present moment, that slicker owes me a dollar six bits. Did you see him after that? I went to his apartment to collect, but I didn't see him. He must have been out to dinner, so I stuck around. Did you see anyone else when you were up there? Nobody but Doc Yeager. Do I get my money or don't I? Yeager? He was up there? Bard was out to the both of us. What time was this? Oh, I don't know. Half past eight, maybe. I knocked on Bard's door and he didn't answer, so I stuck around in the corridor. It was raining out and I was wet to me pelt. 
Then Doc Yeager came up. Did Yeager see you? No, he never seen me, but he was there. You ask him. Well, tell me about Yeager. What happened? I was drying myself with the radiator on the stairway landing. I was down half a flight, so he didn't see me. Never seen a man so scared, the way he kept looking around. Hardly find the keyhole, his hand was shaking so. I don't know how many keys he tried before he got the one that fitted. He shut the door behind him so quiet I could hardly hear it. He couldn't have been in there more than a minute and he still acted like he was scared of his own shadow. He never seen me, but he was there. You ask him. Doc, come into my office again, will you? Okay. And now do I get my financial reimbursement? There you are. You can always tell a gentleman by the way he treats a lady. Just a minute. I want you to wait in here. Come in, Doc. You don't look well, Doc. Sit down. Oh, I'm all right. Tired, that's all. Too much night work, I guess. I'm not as young as I was. What's up, Sam? Bard's death is a lucky break for you, isn't it, Doc? I don't get you. This malpractice case the grand jury's got on you. Bard did some investigating for the medical association, didn't he? Oh, he's got nothing on me. I wonder what happened to the evidence he dug up. It isn't in either his apartment or his office. Because there never was any. I heard different. Funny how it disappeared, isn't it, Doc? Oh, you're not insinuating that I... That you got a hold of it? Yes, I am, Doc. Boy, that's ridiculous. I haven't been out of the building since the body was found. Maybe you were out before it was found. I was not. You weren't in Bard's apartment early this evening? Certainly not. Along about 8.30? No. Suppose I told you you were seen going into Bard's apartment with one of your keys. You stayed there a few minutes, then left, locking the door after you. Whoever said that's a liar? Who's calling me a liar? It's yourself that's the liar. I seen you a sneaking into the poor murdered boy's apartment and sneaking out again with the mark of can all over your face. And that's how the poison got in Bard's whiskey. Help! Help! Zachary. Hey, that's the guy broke jail. Yeah, the Philadelphia Phantom. I won my fight by a knockout, so now I'm back. <laughs> you got back just in time. Well, I guess this ought to wash things up, eh? Not exactly. You're still under arrest. Well, if that ain't gratitude. Don't worry, Zachary. I'll be in your corner when your case comes up. Thanks, pal. You can count on both of us. I think Yeager's confession will be sufficient. Much obliged, Lieutenant. There's still a misdemeanor charge against you, Mr. Templeton. But I don't think it will interfere with your wedding plans. You're invited to our wedding, Lieutenant. Fine. I'll be there. 
to kiss the bride. <laughs> Good luck to both of you. Thank you. Now, why couldn't something like that happen to me? Hmm. Oh, nobody loves a copper. Why don't you ask her? Ask her? Ask who? What? Yeah, ask her out to breakfast with you. She ought to be pretty hungry by now. You're nuts. It's been done. After the going over I gave her? I still say it's been done. Maybe you got something there. You're free to go now. We have the confession of a Dr. Yeager. Oh. I'm glad you didn't touch that drink. So am I. I've just had the pleasure of telephoning Max Calvert and informing him that his stooge murdered Walter Bard, which, of course, ruins his front page on Janet Bradley. And that's about all, unless you want to tell me what you took away from Bard, between ourselves, of course. I feel I can tell you now. I didn't trust you before. You didn't seem to be yourself, but now you do. Thanks. It's quite a story. Suppose I tell you about it some evening, soon. Suppose you do. Thank you. Yes, the lieutenant was very complimentary, Mr. Jones. He said if I hadn't found the body in the clothes closet, the case might never have been solved. Hey, fellas, look at this. I'll call you back. Green Lights had its premiere the week of February 15th, 1946. Even with all my experience of investigation, information on the reception of the film is pretty scarce. Seems it was just another seat filler for people trying to stay warm on a cold February night. All in all, it ain't a bad reel. Like I said, the money bags of Fox decided to take a few liberties with the truth, but I could still see parts that were portrayed close to the way it really shook down. Until next time, be sure to keep your eyes peeled for those elusive shadows in the dark. <laughs>